Before I present this contemplation, I must offer my own view on the distinction between truth and fact. This is necessary because, mostly, these two words are used in society as almost two synonyms, which is not the case in the vocabulary I use, have used in the past contemplation presentations, and will use in this one and others. So the way I use the word truth is to attempt to define, which is impossible by words, something that has the following logical characteristics. 1. It is absolute. This means that if it is true, it is true in all its aspects. If one aspect of it, regardless of its size and significance, is not true, then none of what is being addressed can be defined as true, then becoming a fact instead. 2. It is immutable. This means that if it is true, it will never change given that absolute truth is complete and independent. What is true now was true before and will always be true. Thus, its completion. Nothing is missing from it. It is not a fashion or subject to perception. Thus, its independence. If itself is subject to any changes or to interpretation or perception, then it is a fact and not truth. 3. It is sovereign. This means that if it is true, then it is not only beyond all incomplete and relative facts, it transcends them, but is also sovereign to them, because it has no dependence at all. It does not need or move, because it has everything, and therefore seeks or demands nothing. That which is true has therefore absolute autonomous and timeless self-existence, which is also my definition of the word life. That which is factual has a relative existence because it depends on external factors to remain and cannot therefore achieve completion while remaining a factual existence, that is, while keeping in itself aspects that are not true. 4. It is timeless. If it is subject to the illusion of time, which is merely the device used to provide a delay in the inevitable mortality of factual existence, it is mortal because it is dependent, then it is not true. With the delay provided by the illusion of time, factual existence, hence bearing in itself falsehood, is able to go through its own mirrored stories, where its own non-truths are mirrored back from several points of view and obtain a connection to the transcending truth, which is beyond inevitable factual death, ineffable and incomprehensible to anything that holds any relativity and falsehood. Note that truth is timeless, not eternal. A fact can be eternal, which means that it exists as long as time exists. Truth does not depend on anything, therefore it is beyond the illusion of time as well. Now bear with me if this sounds like word spaghetti. To communicate any realized contemplations I must use words and give them what I see as more appropriate definitions. If necessary, re-listen to the previous segment as many times as needed. Now, given that the definitions of truth and its contrast with fact are presented, one can infer that facts will always have a tendency to shrink with time, because they have mortality, which is a result of dependence and relativity. As stated, time is but a provided delay for mortality's context and awareness 
so it is just an opportunity for factual existence to experience its own incompleteness and be given the choice to either move away from it or stay in that incompleteness or falsehood in many of its relative points of view. Without time, falsehood would never be, because it would be dead as it started with no delay. Time is, therefore, the essential element of stories. Our minds need stories because of their dependence on time. To think, we need to form a timeline where one element comes before another and develops a narrative that can be used. This is a neutral tool in itself, for it can be used for either reinforcing more falsehood or to attempt to shed it. A mind without a foundation story or narrative, for instance, has no ground to set their feet on, so to speak, and is therefore going to seek a story to fill that vacancy. Such is the need for narrative in our minds. We all have narratives with our families and friends, for instance, with timelines and ups and downs, so as to be able to catalog priorities and store important information about the world we are in. This generates discrimination, because the stories assist in the mind's attempt to distinguish truth from falsehood, good from evil, comfort from danger. Discrimination in the mind is an essential element for a mind set into a world of timed, false, relative dependency. Otherwise, the mind's deepest directive is restrained, which is to aim at approaching truth beyond time, beyond falsehood, beyond relativity, and beyond dependency, even if this directive is entirely unconscious or unknown to the thinker. This word has been given a bad rap recently on purpose by parasitical shadows and reflections that are dependent on the continued existence of falsehood and that are seeing their world shrink in its inevitable mortality. They attacked the concept of discrimination just as they also attacked the concept of ego, for instance, exactly because they are essential to the mind's directive of striving towards truth. If nothing can be distinguished, discrimination is then weakened, and if there is no strength or power to make any choice, ego is then weakened, then falsehood can survive. Note how even individuals who claim they are against discrimination have to discriminate themselves. They distinguish those who discriminate in ways that they deem negative from those who do not. That distinction is a discrimination, of course, and there is an ego in there that enacted that moral choice in the mind. The ego is the guardian, the caretaker of the mind. And, like stated in previous contemplations, if the ego is weak, it will not be able to make distinctions that are in the best interests of the mind's directive, which is to aim for truth, and is then vulnerable to distinctions that go against it. Now, granted, some minds clearly do not have that living directive in them. They do not ever aim to seek truth even at the expense of the illusions they depend on. But those minds are only reflections existing in the foggy mirror world and do not connect to truth outside it at all. This is, however, not the subject of this contemplation. So, how do minds subject to factual existence but that have the directive to seek truth even if, like stated, this directive is unknown to the conscience in the mind, try to aim at something as incomprehensible and as ineffable to them. The minds that first are able to obtain realizations of truth, then try to translate them into words and into the form of an outline that tells a story. 
a series of events that follow a timeline. This guides or directs the minds of the readers or listeners towards the same direction where they originally obtained the realization they try to convey. Note that the significant aspects of these stories reside on its outline, which is usually very simple. These stories that rely on a simple outline and direct the minds towards their own contemplations and realizations, instead of ready-to-serve formulated conclusion, are in my view and definition myths. Myths are the attempt of minds who realize they are stuck in a false factual dependency to convey a realization towards a truth that is beyond any possible communication. So using the way the mind is set up for narratives in this existence, they position elements in a way that outlines a relationship between them, which then directs the mind to contemplate for themselves about those elements and how they relate. This is why True myths are always simple in their outline when we remove embellishing details. Details do not matter in myths because they are just there to help convey the story in a more comfortable way for our minds. Change the details but keep the outline and the myth still holds its purpose. I would recommend revisiting the contemplation named Stories, Outline versus Details for more on this aspect. Now, in contrast, a hoax is a story that aims at turning the minds away from contemplation at all, much less any kind of realization of truth. The aims of hoaxes are to strengthen and perpetuate facts, that is, to strengthen dependent falsehood and feed their power over the mind. Now, to achieve this, first the focus must be moved away from the outline, which reveals the purpose of the story, and set entirely into its details. Then, the details must be elevated to the status of truth, so that the mind is tempted to treat them as dogma, and not contemplate further, lest the hoax be discovered for what it is, usually enforced by a priesthood of experts. This is also how a myth is turned into a hoax, by adding details, by turning the focus onto them, and by pretending that those details are truth, by making them a dogma instead of focusing on the original outline of the adulterated myth. All this said, I hope that with the explanation of my used vocabulary and my presented view on the difference between myths and hoaxes, that it becomes more clear that although we have to use words in our social context, they are but details in the hoax that our factual existence represents. We can, metaphorically speaking, prefer to use outlines of true myths that point towards the absolute beyond relative facts and then we use words as a tool instead of being used by them. In fact, as we do so, we are even able to transmute a hoax into a myth by seeing an outline that was not originally written there by the false authors and playwrights. It is always how we direct our minds and souls, how we morally choose within that defines our alignment with life and truth instead of with the mirrors of the world of fog. Hence the need to have a strong ego capable of using discrimination in a sane manner. Maybe now it becomes clearer why I repeat so often that truth speaks no words. Because words are relative, dependent on understanding and details. Truth is an instant realization of a transcendence in relation to our factual existence, of course, that can only be reached through a metaphorical, silent climbing of the sturdy outlines of true myths. <laughs>